There's a saying that people often use and that is you should never meet your heroes. Well, I don't really agree with that and I've been given an incredible opportunity to spend the day with mine. I am super, super excited and understandably so I think a little bit nervous. So this is an off track special with John Lund. Over the next few weeks, we are going to bring you the biggest programme we have ever done here on BSCDA TV. I'm going to be chatting with John about his career, his cars, his rivalries, life away from the farm and much, much more. Absolute uh, privilege to be sat in your kitchen, John. Thank you very much. You make a very good uh, drink, I have to say. <laughs> it's oh, very, nice it's it's so. Yeah, it's a good stock car driver and a good coffee maker. Um, it's, it is very surreal. Um, thank you for allowing us to come up today. Um, there's been loads of interest, I'm sure, in what we're doing. But when I sat down to do some prep, um, I found it really, really hard to like put down on paper what I wanted to ask you because there's there's just so much you know there's so much we could talk about and so I thought let's start with your your racing career it's, a, it's a kind of the, the best place to start your first meeting was Rochdale in 1976 and um, have you got any memories of that first meeting um well obviously it was the first time I'd, I'd raced yeah. and uh, the car I built a car myself a Buick, it had a Buick engine in I uh, got to Rochdale, track's quite rough, yeah. uh, I remember it had been, the shell was quite black, a black colour, mm -hmm. and um, a high kerb and it used to flood on the inside and if you went through there you, you know, you got drowned really. Um, but not not too many memories of the racing really, I, I, I remember I, I had a bit of an incident with Willie Harrison, I probably got in his way. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, don't, I didn't get any place in Zeta. Yeah. I think I might just have got, got a, a place in the consolation to qualify for the final, but I can't, I can't really remember now. Do you remember if you were like nervous, were you like apprehensive, or were you like... Yeah, obviously I would be. The, yeah. the thing I noticed most, or I didn't notice most, was that although there was obviously spectators there, once you get out on the track and the racing starts, you just completely forget about them, and you, all you're thinking about is no, not crashing. Yeah, really. absolutely. So you know, you, you raced that first meeting, but but what attracted you to the to the sport in the first place? Well, originally, um, I used to go to Nelson, which is quite local. I was just watching, yeah. okay. and it was more the building of the car that I yeah I was interested in. So when when people come into to sports, be it stock cars or like athletics or whatever it is, um, people, I guess people always want to. They have an aspiration, a goal. So when you came into to Formula One, did you want to be the number one in the sport? Was that kind of what you came in to do? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, there's Stuart Smith, Will Harris, and Doug Cronshaw. They were like gods, you know. Yeah. My goodness, to get on the same footing as them was just no. <laughs> that's yeah. not going to happen, you know. No, it was just to take part, really. And yeah. I built this car and I wanted to see, you know, if it if it went all right, really, and to try and make it better. So, mm. so you mentioned like you, you know, a few great drivers there. Were, were they your heroes when you came in? Were they your kind of the, the drivers that you aspired to to be? Well, when I was watching, I mean, at that time, Smithy was winning everything. You know, it was just virtually unbeatable. You know, yeah. and. I, when you watched, yeah, I could understand why now, but a lot a lot of drivers, Smithy couldn't be behind them and they just sort of let him pass, you know. And I used to think, if I was out there, I wouldn't let him really pass. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, he always got past anyway. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've got, um, 
I've got a question for you from uh, Frank Raymond Jr. now. Hi John, uh, my question to you is obviously you started racing in 1976 um, and then obviously your first world final win was 87. I just wondered if there was a defining moment in your career up to when you started winning a lot of things. So obviously you raced for 10, 11 years and then bang you started winning every weekend. Just wondered if something changed or if, if something clicked uh, or just a defining moment really. Cheers. When I first started I, um, I used to crash a lot, do a lot of damage and I soon discovered that um, if you're only going and doing one race you weren't getting much experience really. Yeah. So I sort of I think I mentally decided I'll just have to slow down and just learn, learn a bit more really before I get too carried away. So I, that's what I did really. I spent quite a few years just learn, learning about it. You get, you got to know the other drivers. You, you could recognise the cars. You just see the corner of the bumper and you knew who that was and how they drove and yeah. just got, got to know the job really. And I, I think by the sort of the mid eighties. Uh, I got a bit more confidence in, you know, that I, could, well, I can beat some of these, you know. Yeah. And then late in 86, they had a dash for the cash at, at Bellevue, which I was lucky enough to win, you know. I think that probably gave me confidence and a big boost. And uh, I went on from there, really. I suppose that, if you wanted a defining moment, maybe that was perhaps one of them, really, yeah. that, that win, you know. Mm. I think no matter who you are, isn't it, like stock cars, success seems to be built on confidence you know you can't mm. just go out and win and I think like you sort of 10 years of just kind of learning that craft and that trade and mm. actually it all comes to fruition you can't just go into it and be successful from day one can you no I, I don't think so and you've got to get used to being you know you go to one meeting have a good meeting and think oh I've cracked it now and then you go the next time and it's just a total disaster so it's you've got to get used to the bad times as yeah. well you know and get over that and think about the next one you know yeah Okay, mm -hmm. well, thank you for that. Um, you know, you had an incredibly successful career. Um, you won the world title uh, eight times. Out of those eight championship victories, which one meant the most to you? Oh, without a doubt, the first one at the old Bellevue, really. Yeah. So why yeah. was that? Uh, well, the first one. Yeah. Um, it's an, it was an amazing stadium. Uh, I don't think since then there's been a place to match it, really. Uh, the atmosphere was absolutely brilliant, you know, and uh, the crowd was. After after I won, you know, you, you were going around and they all stood up, and oh, it was just amazing, really awesome, yeah. So we sat yeah. here like you know, however many years later. Can you still see it as if it was yesterday in your mind? Yeah, some aspects yeah. of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And the car, you know, the car. Well, before before the meeting, I. Probably spent lots of time getting the car ready. You change the half shafts because, you know, something like that breaks. That's the end of it, isn't it? And put a lot of hours in, and I, I actually, we, you had to get there quite early, and we got the car scrutineered, and then it wasn't till race two or three, you know. So I, I fell asleep in the bus for a while, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, it was coming up to the start of the race, and um, the previous race. The track had been quite wet and John Dowson was parked next to us and I said, um, I had a, a gripper on the outside, an alliance gripper on the outside, back of my car, uh, whereas m most of the rest of the drivers at that time had RS5s and you know, and John Dowson came off the track, he'd just raced in the previous race, I said, what do you reckon John, should I leave this on it? Is it drying up much? She says, well, it's dry around this bottom bend, it's around the top, it's still pretty wet, you'll be all right with that, I think. <laughs> so I left it on, you know, and I, I think that proved to be the, the winning combination, you know. So I got a good start, and, yeah. Did you ever say thank you to him afterwards? Oh, yeah, yeah several times. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to that, uh, 1980, I don't know. Um, after, after the race and the presentation, I came out and uh, I bumped into Clive Linton who I didn't know of that well really, but I must have had a bit of a coming together with um, Nigel Wharton yeah. at Leicester, I think it was, and done something, and I think Nigel had been on to win and I'd cocked him up. And, and uh, 
he said, you come, he come round in the pits and he was quite, quite cross with me. He said, you bloody couldn't drive a nail into a piece of wood or something like that. I said, Timmy. <laughs> anyway, uh, he come and shook my hand. He says, I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite good, yeah. You, you, you and Clavin sort of got a good relationship isn't it, further on. Yeah, yeah. we did. We, we were yeah. good friends after that, yeah. 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 Another, um, another defining career moment for you, then? Yeah, yeah probably, yeah. I spent a lot of time, um, particularly when it was like a Saturday night at Coventry and a Sunday meeting somewhere else, we'd yeah. stop at Clive's, you know, because he, he lived quite close on yeah. the A5 to Coventry. And, yeah. Brilliant. It was good, really. Good. After go to New Zealand now if I want to go and see him. Yeah, yeah. it's not a bad place to go, is it? No. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> in, yeah. terms, in terms of, um, I guess, other iconic moments in the sport, there's the, the 1991 World Final at Hedensford and that sort of last bend where you, 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 you kind of came through and took the victory. I'm just going to show you that, that video clip and I just want to talk, to talk me through kind of what you saw and how you saw that, that last bend unfolding. I don't remember too much about the start of this race. I think the main thing was keeping out of trouble, which I think at the start I'd, I must have avoided everything. So I had no damage really. Car was going quite well. And I could see um, Peter and Bert in the distance a little bit. Yeah. And then um, I caught up at Andy Hodgson. We'd have we'd already had a flag then, wouldn't we, normally? No. <laughs> I remember that, was it? There. Yeah. But I smoked my tyre. And that, that was the end of it for me winning, really, I think. Right. It, the car went off after that. And uh, I just... I mean, there's still 15 laps to go, maybe, and I just wasn't gaining at all. As much as I tried, that was it. I couldn't make any headway on them. Okay. And then just right at the end, I could see um, Bert. Peter was catching Bert a little bit, but they were both smoking the tyres. And and then that last bend. Did you think he'd have a go on that last bend? Did you think? Yeah, he'd... definitely. Would, well, if I would, definitely. Yeah. yeah. World final. You you're in it to win it, aren't you? Yeah. Hmm. And I just, I can't have been that far behind, really. I soon caught up, anyway. Yeah. Could you see that happening in front of you? And did you think that, did you know, like... Oh, it happened this, that quick. The, yeah, for me. I, I'd settled for third, really. I thought, oh, you know, this is me third. Who's going to win it? Yeah. And uh, then it all happened, didn't it? Yeah. So at what point, was it when you crossed the line? Did you, did you know when you crossed the line, I've won it? Or did you think somebody had... No, I knew I'd won it when yeah. I crossed the line, definitely. <laughs> yeah. I knew, I knew Bert and Peter were first yeah. and second. Mm. No, it's, it's, like, it's, it's not, like I say, iconic moment in the sport, isn't it? That, that last bend, it's, it's still talked about to oh, this day. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, there's another um, iconic moment, and I've got the picture in my hallway at home, and it's a world final that you didn't win. Um, <laughs> it's the, the 1990 race, 1999 race at Coventry. So we should have a quick look at that yeah, one. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I don't, I don't really remember the start of this too well. I didn't even know that I got into the lead at the start. I can't remember that really. It was quite wet, didn't it, that track? It mm. was quite, quite a wet track. I think it was possibly a day at a court on Ian Higgins, maybe. I can't remember. Yeah, that's Ian Higgins there, isn't it? Yeah. And then I got going again and uh, and the rivalry between Andrew and Frankie was, you know, there were big rivals at that time and there was no way Andrew would let Frank win if he could help it, you know. Yeah. And I benefited from that because I was quite a way behind them and then they started battling and I kept just gaining a little bit, gaining a bit. But not just enough to, to really challenge for the lead. But each time they had to go at each other, I got a bit closer. And then... Um, we're getting close to the end and I could see that Andrew had lined Frank up again for a biggie. I thought, well, if I can just get Andrew at the same time, put them both wide, that might be him with a chance here. But um, Andrew left it on a bit longer than, than I thought he was going to do, so I didn't just connect with Andrew and I ended up running around, <laughs> going wide and around the back of him. 
I was lucky to get out of it, really. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, Frank's dad actually came second. Yeah. And I came third. But it was a good race, that. A good race, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a fantastic stock car mm. race. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, you've got the sports top drivers battling out for the biggest prize, mm. you know, and I think, you know, going into that last bend, at what point did you know you got it wrong? Do you know what I mean? Was it like... Um, what? Well, not got it wrong, do you know what I mean? But it's kind of like... It, well, the truth is, you, you, you decide what you're going to do Yeah. a little bit in advance. Like, well, it's going to be now or never, because if, um, if Frankie rides this one out, uh, you know, Andrew's going to be out of shape, he'll win this. Yeah. So it's got to be now or never. So I just went went for it, but Andrew went even deeper than yeah. I thought, and I just went too deep, you yeah. know, and couldn't. <laughs> so ended up trapped behind them, over the top of them. <laughs> so how do you, you know? How do you feel? How did you feel like that? Was it were you disappointed? Or were you like, oh, do you know what? It's been a, you know, how how do you react to that? Uh, well, you, you're doing your best to yeah. to get going again, really, because you think, oh, well, there's still a chance, you know. <laughs> yeah, look at the positives. Yeah, yeah. I can't. I think, I think it stopped actually. My car stopped and get it started again. We'll have to do bounce around like quite often. They flood yeah. up, take a while to get going. And I think I had a flat tire as well. And amazingly, you yeah. know, it went went another few laps really. Yeah, because that car. When I built that car, it was quite a bit shorter, probably yes. through going to New Zealand where their cars are mainly shorter. And um, Andrew's, Stuart Smith, Andrew's dad said, oh, you'll never get that to work, it's too bloody short, you want it longer, you know. So that made me more determined than ever to try and make it yeah. work. And it, it did have some good good moments, really. Occasionally, it was really good, yeah. but more often than not, it wasn't so good. But, Anyway, <laughs> but when you've got Stuart Smith telling you it's not going to work, like you say, I'm sure it kind of spurred you on to. Yeah, yeah. One meeting at Hednesford, it absolutely flew that car. You know, it was like you didn't need the brakes. It was brilliant. And then I went back to the next Hednesford with it all set up just the same. It was rubbish. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, we mentioned Stuart and uh, Stuart Smith there, and uh, Andrew uh, Smith obviously featured in that race. Um, Andrew's got a question for you. Hello John and Annette, I hope you're keeping well up there and you're all safe and good. Um, I've been asked to pose a question or two to you by Jonathan and uh, before I do that I'd just like to say how great it is really that the BSCD have nailed you down for this because you know your longevity and success in the sport is unparalleled and uh, the fans are just going to love, love watching this interview with you so it's really good from that point of view. On to my questions, well unsurprisingly my questions relate to the World Championship. Obviously the World Final is dear to my heart for obvious reasons. And I'm sure it is to yours as well, with you being the you know, the greatest world champion the sport's ever seen. Um, the first question I'd like to ask you is what do you consider your greatest drive in a world final? Well, you know, you've been in countless world finals, you've won more than anybody else, obviously. You must have some great memories, but what's, what, what do you consider your greatest drive? And the second part of the question is on reflection, looking back at all them world finals, which meant the most to you and why? Um, and that's it really. I hope you enjoy your interview. See you later. Well, this is the second part of the question, which I think Bellevue world final, I think that was the, you know, the one I remember the most. Um, Greatest drive. That Bellevue World Final. Um, I remember that. I remember most most of the laps in that. But quite often I was out on my own a bit. Yeah. Um, but there was one World Final at Bradford, um, which I think Burnsy came second. Bobby Burns came second. The track was wet. And. Um, there was cars all over for the full race. Every lap, you were missing stuff, avoiding stuff, and that that I think was the hardest, the hardest world final I've done. Just just demand, mentally demanding. I was med at the end. I was Ed had gone. You know, it was yeah. hard. Just keep keeping out of trouble, but being fast at the same time. So I think that's the one I remember as being the, the you know, the, my best drive, perhaps. Yeah. 
it's perhaps not memorable in many people's minds, you know, because I wasn't really challenged for the lead as such by other cars, yeah. but I was challenged by everybody, yeah. if you know what I mean. Absolutely. So I think I think I put that down as my greatest, yeah, my greatest drive. But perhaps many people wouldn't really think of it like that, you know. Yeah, but it's, that's absolutely from your perspective, though, mm. isn't it? Just me and I get, and I get that. You know, when if, if you were when you're in the world final, do you feel like a real weight of expectation, like it is a special race? Because when you talk to some drivers about world finals, they go, oh, "I just treat it like any other race." Was it different for you? Was a world final different for you? Oh, you, you tend to go into it and try and treat it as a just another race, but yeah. it isn't, is it? No. You've got, I think you've got to be, a, I think the killer instinct's the wrong word, but if you want to win, you've got to, you've got to be determined, and if somebody's in your way, you've got to make sure that you yeah. um, get them out of the way, really. But at the same time, you, you don't want to destroy everybody on the track because you need them there. If somebody at the end of the race gets f faster and starts gaining, and the more cars there are between you and him, yeah. the better, really. So I think the, the secret is to pass it over you can and, and leave them still going behind, you know. You know, like Andrew mentioned on there that world finals are really important to him, to him for obvious reasons. Did you prioritise world finals over maybe the points championship? Did, was any one more important than the other? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I won the points championship a few times, but um, the world final definitely was the one I, yeah. you know, was more determined to win. And, you know, the, I find the semi finals really more of a, an issue because you know if you didn't qualify that was it wasn't it yeah, really of course. yeah and I had a few disasters in semi-finals and didn't qualify for a world final which you know it's annoying watching world finals when you want to be but once you're there do you know it's all one race then yeah you've just one chance at it you've got to go for it do you like that like sudden death aspect of it of yeah it? I do yeah yeah yeah. Mm. yeah well it's the same for everybody as well isn't it so you know, everybody's in the same boat, really. With one chance at it yeah. that day, aren't they? It must be a very bizarre experience for you as a as a driver, because you, you know the world final meeting. It's it's a huge event. You know, you've got you know the crowd's massive, the pits are bustling, and it must be like you know it's such a noisy environment. And you're on track on, and just that moment before the race starts, when it's just you in the car on your own, it must be very surreal. Do you know what I mean? It's just you go from that to that. Ah, it's certainly different, yeah, yeah, different, yeah. They want they once changed the format at um, at Coventry where they had the fireworks yeah. before the world final. And for me, y you sort of got used to the format how it was, you know, yeah. and you were in heat two or three for the for the world final, so you got used to it, and they changed it a bit, and I, I didn't like that as much. No, <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't plan a stock car race. You absolutely can't, can you? But you know, when you sat on that that world final grid. Do you, do you formulate a bit of a plan, or is it I'll just I'll adapt to whatever comes in front of me, or do you try and kind of plan how you're going to attack the race? Um, I think that the first one at um, was it that one? Yeah, the first one at Bellevue. No, I didn't really plan that one. There was one I think uh, earlier on where I was behind. I think Wolf Wolfie was in it. And I was behind Wolfie, and I knew I had to, you know, get past Wolfie if I was yeah. going to stand a chance. So I was determined. I think I was on the outside. I was determined to shove him wide, first bend if I could get to him and get away. And um, I think that that particular meeting, they had a stoppage, and uh, I think Smithy was leading, and uh, on the restart. They made a bit of a hash of the restart, as I remember, okay. and uh, the, I think it was Bertie was I was second maybe, and I was all psyched. I was second behind Smithy. I thought on the restart I'll have to get Smithy and get away, you know. Yeah. And Bert was behind me, but we'll come down to the flag for the green flag, you know. The flagman's there, but he never dropped the flag. So I thought, oh, it must be another. And Smithy must have felt the same. It must be another rolling lap, and they actually seemed to drop the flag on on Craig's, on Bert's roof. Yeah. So we didn't realise, and everybody set off behind us, you know, and it, it well, you know, it destroyed yeah. any chance I had of getting, getting to Smithy, you know. But if Smithy eventually won it, you know, he, um, he was back down the places, but he got going yeah. and won it, yeah. I don't know what happened to me. 
<laughs> Make out of punch or something. Yeah, you did, yeah. Well, you didn't win it, did you? So no. <laughs> no. no. Um, um, just I guess um, we talk about world finals quite a lot. It, you know, aside from the world finals, is, is there any other standout moment in your career that you go, I'm, I'm really, really proud of that that achievement? Oh, that dash for the cash at, yeah. at the old Bellevue, definitely. Yeah, yeah, because that was at the end of the season, and um, my engine was about jiggered. It had done, done quite a lot of meetings, you know, and um, it was well down on power. So I had to put tyres on which were fairly bold because yeah. if I got too much grip, it would, it, you know, it wouldn't go. So I had to like chuck it in the corners and get it drifting, keep my revs up. And, and uh, that was a good, good race, that. And Smithy got to me, but not just good enough, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> and the, that engine then blew up at the uh, following meeting right. at Coventry, which I think was the last one of the season. But that, I remember that, that race particularly yeah. well. Quite, I've watched it a few times, to be fair. Is it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you sat down and out within that, just like, what should we watch tonight? Right, let me just watch this. <laughs> Let's just put this on telly. <laughs> um, just moving away from World Finals a, a little bit, and uh, you're quite famous for, for having a bit of a last bend lunge at people to go for the, for the victory. I'm just going to show you this, this video clip now. So obviously we're heading this again, aren't we? And this, this was when you got your 200th final win. Now that, that, the car that I'm racing there was the silver car, which was a shell car actually, and it's the car now in the workshop which is red. Right, okay. And um, I don't, the start of that season was when um, the foot and, out, foot and mouth. Right, yeah. As for, for farming people will know about, and we never went anywhere. And it wasn't until this meeting that they lifted the, you know, that we, we really could go anywhere. Yeah. So it was my first meeting of the year, I think, this particular meeting. But I'd qualified for the world final because I'd won it the previous year. So, I'll, and I think the world final was at Headness for that year. So I wanted to go, um, you know, with a view to setting the car up for the world final, really. And as the race unfolded, everybody seemed to fall by the wayside. And I ended up second, and I could see Nick Smith was leading, and it was a fair way in front, but not, not too far. Yeah. So I can just about do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go, yeah. Because you are a long way back on that. I mean, it, it looks, for me watching that clip, you do look, a, a, you're like yeah. a long way back. But it's surprising if you... Uh, when another car's braking and you are still accelerating, yeah. you soon close up the ground. I once, I once at, at Aircliff, quite a long time before, I was second in the final to um, um, another Smith um, from, I think it was from Bradford area. Yeah. And um, I was miles behind, really, and Aircliff's quite a short corner, so you have to really slow down for the, fa for the corner. And I managed to catch, catch him just right and, and win that one. That, yeah. that was a good last bend as well. <laughs> do, you, do you, you only win a race with that sort of that kind of move? It, is, does that feel better? Do you know yeah, what I mean? It's it is yeah, rewarding, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But you've, you've got to, if you don't do it then, you're not going to win, yeah. are you? So yeah. and it's a final. So why give it a go? If yeah. you end up in the fence, well, you tried, didn't you? Yeah. And the crowd like it as well. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've read somewhere before that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Hednesford is your, your favourite track, is that is that right? I found with Hednesford that, because um, it's quite a big track, you, you can adapt your your driving style to the track and get going faster and faster, you know, yeah. if you keep changing your line, you, you can build your speed up, whereas other tracks, like Long, I used to find Long Eaton, you, you got to a certain speed lapping and no matter what you did you couldn't go any quicker yeah. you know you, you're stuck in a, a in a rut really but Hednesford you could sort of use the track more and get going faster and quicker and, yeah. and catch people up you know similarly uh, when we used to race at Bradford in the 80s and 90s similar there yeah. because it's a big track you could use the track and find a dry line and, you know, during the latter stages of the race, really catch people up and, and gain. But, um, 
That's why I like them, really. Yeah. So I guess the bigger tracks, and if, if you want to narrow it down a bit more, did you have a preference for Cheryl or Tarmac? I guess when you were, you know, doing week in, week out racing, was there a preference? No, I didn't mind, really. Yeah. I, I liked both of them equally, yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't. Both, both surfaces, really. Yeah. But over the years, as, as the racing's developed, and um, drivers have got more access particularly on tarmac to go yeah. and practice it's made it much more difficult yeah to be competitive on tarmac just turning up at the meeting sort yeah. of thing so i've it was time really i find it difficult to yeah. compete whereas at shell you just turn up set your car up how you think and change it perhaps a bit yeah. and go from there and it's more the same for everybody then yeah of course it is. I think with it, people coming into the sport, I guess Shell is a bit more difficult to master, isn't it? You know, like you talked at the beginning of uh, today, and you're saying that you've got to learn your craft, haven't you? Mm. I think Shell is very much like that, isn't it? You, drivers have got to have a good couple of seasons to really get to grips with Shell, whereas Tarmac is a bit easier to, to get to grips with from the outset. Yeah, yeah. And I think probably when I started as well, you couldn't afford to make mistakes. You ended up in the wires, and that was it, end yeah. of it. But now, if you... If you make a bit of a mistake, you'll hit, hit the barrier, hopefully bounce out and keep going, you know. Yeah. So I think you, you've got to be, you're driving, you've got to be a b bit more refined or something. I don't know what the right word yeah. is, but yeah, just not to hit the fence. <laughs> yeah, you, don't, you don't hit the fence. Mm. Um, we've spoken around you know, your, your final victories and, and, and great things you've achieved in your career. Um, when you, is there any kind of moment where somebody's given you a, a great piece of advice that you've kind of really stuck with you? Um, and equally, if somebody was coming into the sport and wanted to be the next John Lund, what piece of advice would you give them? Um, That's a big question. When I first started, um, I used to spin around a lot. One meeting, I was blowing loads, and bend my front axle, and loads of damage. And we were at Nelson one night, and I think number 60, Ron Cottrell. Right. I must have taken him out in a race by spinning out, being out of control. And he come across, and he was from Yorkshire, and he says, you want to get your car sorted out, lad, that's no good. He says, get your front axle tilted back a bit. Get some. And he says, it'll stop spinning round. So I did that, but he advised me to tip it back a bit, so I did it far too much yeah. to start with. So the steam was really heavy and I struggled to drive it, but soon got it right and what a difference it made, you yeah. know. So I think as a good piece of advice, that was that was definitely, definitely ranked. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of, if I say, you know, somebody's, coming to, somebody's watching this, they're going to come to Formula Stock Cars, they want to be John Lund, what, what piece of advice would you give them? Uh, don't get disillusioned if you get taken out or you, you know, you just got to come back, forget forget that, come back the next week and st st try again, you know, you'll get there eventually. It's just time, do laps and get used to it. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Thank you. I reckon it's time for bacon cob. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said you wanted to see my car. There it is. Very, so this is where it all happens, John. This is, this is the hub of your... <laughs> I don't know about that, <laughs> anyway, but... This is where I spend quite a bit of time. It's very nice. It's, it's, it's probably a bit smaller than what I, th I thought. I thought you know, just to me, you know, I don't know. It's it's quite compact, isn't it? Um, well, it's it's tidy at the moment. You did that for us, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. It's brilliant. So you spend. You must spend. Uh, well, it's pretty religiously Tuesdays and Thursday nights. Yeah. I think which in the stock car circle is circles quite common for some reason. Yeah. And. Um, and then if there's loads of damage all yeah. night sometimes. And, yeah. yeah. You've got a fire, which yeah, is important because yeah. it's not warm, is it? <laughs> no, no, no. Stephen, who comes, he comes most Tuesdays and Thursday nights to help with the car and he always gets the fire going. Yeah, that's first, first job. First job. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> so let's talk about your, your cars. Um, I guess from the outset, you, you've always built your own cars and, and have continued to do so. Do you get as much enjoyment from that as you do from actually racing them and winning the races? Uh, well, when I first started, we used to go to Nelson watching yeah. and uh, Rochdale occasionally as well. And I did enjoy welding, you know, and fabricating, yeah. but it was always just gates or something like that. Pretty boring, really. And I was looking around the cars, oh, I'd be interested in making one of those, you know. And you'd go around pits and, oh, I like how he's done that, I might 
I'm like, try to do that, you know. So I, that's how I came really to build a car in the first place. And then um, obviously once I built it, I needed to try it out and see if it was any good. <laughs> yeah. Which is, well, that's how it started really. Yeah. Mm. So you, you've built some like pretty iconic cars over the years, you know, very well recognised. Is, is there one that was your, your favourite or, or your best if you, if you had to choose? I think that car which everybody calls a gold car. Yeah. I think that, yeah, that's probably that one really. So why, yeah. why was that? What was it? What was so special about it? Um, well, I, I built it originally and I raced it for a year or so and then uh, Lisa Harter bought it. Yeah. And she, she raced it for a year or so. And then uh, in the meantime, I built another car and she, she wanted the, the newer one, so she traded the old one back in. So it was just outside for a little while. And then um, um, in the meantime, I've been to New Zealand and met Bryce Penn, yeah. who, you know, from, from New Zealand. Good. And he, he came over with his son and he wanted a car to race and he said well we'll we'll get this one going because i had an engine for it and everything so over the couple of weeks that they were here they built that up and raced that you know and um, obviously that's september time towards the end of the season so the following winter i thought well i might as well race that car so we sort of rebuilt it again and started racing it again you know and Rest it for three or four years, a good car. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, and we'll talk about that, that particular car a bit later on. I've got a question from Ian Higgins for you. Mm. Right. Hiya. My question, John, is um, where did you get the ideas from for the designs of your cars? Um, your flat chassis layout was one that a lot of us uh, copied in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, I believe Dave C might have had some involvement, but um, where did you get your ideas from for designing your cars? Cheers. Well, around, around that time, um, I think when I first started, most of the cars were, were a tapered chassis to match the, the layout of an LD van. Right, okay. The springs were tapered, so they were narrow at the front and a bit wider at the back. And that, that made it quite hard work, I found, for putting your nerfers on and everything, because everything was at a bit funny angles. So I thought, well, that'd be easy to just make it square. So I, I made the chassis straight as parallel to start with. And um, a lot of the cars also, um, the box section, which they used for the chassis straights, they would use two or three pieces welded together. Yeah. And that was hard work as well. So. I, I just used one piece of box section, I think, which was three, three by three by quarter wall or something, which not many people were doing at that time. It was just loads better, you know. Yeah. There was one or two using four by four box, which is bigger, but because it, it was bigger, it crushed easier. Right, okay. When you got an impact in the nerf, it would squash the box right, section okay. and lose its strength. But three by three, just being a bit smaller, it, it didn't crush as easily. And um, I think Alan Barker and John Hillen were the main car constructors yeah. at that time and they both had their individual design for the front of the chassis to stop it yeah going out of shape and I thought well I could I could see the advantage of both but I could also see that both of them had disadvantages yeah so I sort of amalgamated the two a little bit and made my own sort of design of the cross in the front which I still use now yeah. you know and it, it worked really well you know it, it Never really bent much. So. <laughs> it's good. That's good. Yeah. Do you know? It, it sounds like from describing that that you're spending a lot of time kind of thinking and like how you can how you can do stuff. Is is it was it constantly on your mind when you are doing the yeah, cows yeah. or in the field? Like yeah, constantly. Quite think often you just you know you'd be think you're driving the tractor around and thinking about you know what am I going to do tonight? How am I going to make that better? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So you know when you, you 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 built a car. I mean, I remember as a as a fan, you built a car, and, a, and when your new car came out, it was a massive deal. Do you know what I mean? John has got a new car. Um, was there always a queue of people wanting to buy your older car? Do you know what I mean? Because we didn't have Facebook or the internet then, but there was always people kind of, I want I want your old car, John. No, not especially. No. Well, yeah, I suppose I saw the yeah, yeah. They all went somewhere, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. Did you not have people on the phone going, John, I want to sell me a car? Uh, well, Lisa was quite keen to buy one, yeah. and, and and Daniel, Lisa's brother, yeah, 
um, Noddy Trousdale's brother. Yeah. He he was keen to buy that um, gold car. Um, so we've got the red one here now, haven't we? And then we had the, the, the one before this was the green one. Is that is that got, gone now? I've not seen it. Has yeah, it that's gone to a lad in Holland's bought okay. that. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, this this car is actually older than the, the yeah. green one. I raced and um, I raced it before. It used to be silver. Yeah. And I decided to revamp this one, yeah. really. Of course. Yeah. You know, like when... Um, in terms of like, you spoke about car construction and, and your chassis layout, but the rule book's quite strict, isn't it, in terms mm. of what you can and can't do. Is there one innovation that you've come up with that you've thought about that you've gone, that's the, the best idea I've ever had. I'm, I'm really proud of that innovation that I brought into the sport. Uh, well, just as I was saying before, the design of the, the cross in the yeah. front, I think it made a big difference. And also the sump guard. Okay. Yeah. When I first started a lot of the sump guard, all it did was guard the sump. It wasn't really giving any strength to the chassis and all, but yeah. I just carried it on a bit and made it made it stronger. Which I think helped you, if you were confident in your car, you know, you, you, you knew you could take a knock and it wouldn't bend. And, yeah. Mm, which helps you race. Of course it, it does, yeah. of course it does. And um, you know, your cars have always been um, incredibly successful. I guess the, the one that potentially wasn't as much was your, your last tarmac car. You seemed to kind of sort of struggle with that. Was there, was there a reason kind of you think that happened? Time. Right, okay. Yeah. I think for tarmac, particularly now, you need to be able to have time to go and uh, just laps, do laps, practice yeah. and get the car set up and get your tyres sorted. And Whereas it, on shale, you, you just turn up and go out in the first heat. And yeah. The uh, car's not right, so you alter it a bit. And, for the consolation, if you haven't qualified or the final, yeah. try and get it. And the track changes during the night quite a lot, you know. Whereas tarmac, you've just got to be spot on right from the start. Yeah. And if you haven't got the, the time to be there, you, you, you're struggling, you know. You know, you, you, you know, you, you raced it quite a few times. Did you want to kind of persist with it and, and try and get it better? Yeah, we got we got it pretty good at times, you know. Yeah. But we just didn't have just the time really to to justify it really. Okay. And then uh, I had a problem with the engine in the car I was using on shale, so we nicked the engine out of it. And so I didn't race tarmac for quite yeah. a while after that, you know. And I think it's something you have to, um, if you don't keep at it, yeah. you soon get left behind, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, still, it's still out there in the next sort of bit yeah, of money, yeah, isn't it? It's still kind of out there, isn't it? Yeah, it's out there. It's good shelf. It is, yeah, it's got some seats on it for your bus, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, talking about tarmac, you were part of that ballistics trial mm -hmm. um, that happened at Hedensford where the cars ran sort of big, big tyres. Yeah, yeah. do, you, do you think the sport should have gone in that direction and, and maybe split into two separate factions because you, obviously you were kind of quite you must have been quite interested to trial it for to take part well it was interesting to try but i think I'd, i think stock cars it didn't really suit stock cars i don't think yeah. i think stock cars is more of a contact yeah thing really i think um the biggest to my mind the biggest influence on the racing has been the fences really yeah doing away with post and rail fence and a plate fence, it allows, you know, drivers to hit the fence, bounce out and keep yeah. going, so okay. it's perhaps in a way it's become a bit less, um, I don't know what the right word is really, you've got to be, you don't need to be as careful, Yeah. your cars are, are more protected, Yeah. whereas in the beginning the, you know, your bumpers were a bit narrow, your nerfers weren't as big and, and strong. So you've got to be more careful or else you ended up with damage and, yeah. you know, you didn't win races if you broke your car sort of thing. So what do you prefer then? Do you prefer them now or do you prefer them then? Do you know what I mean? Because they, they are different. They have become more, like say, more armoured up, if you like, haven't they? Yeah, I think I preferred it before, really. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And so thinking about, um, you know, we talked about you and your, your car building skills, you know, thinking about cars that are racing now and car builders, is there any cars that you particularly admire or car builders that you think actually that they're doing a really great job? That's a lot of lads build good cars now, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, mm, yeah I think all the cars that are racing now are good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And on the standout, you know, and you kind of go, oh, when you're wandering around the pits going, oh, I like that. No, not particularly. Uh, it frustrates me a bit that there's a lot of money spent on some, you know, which 
back in the day you just make it, you know. So it's sort of got gone away a bit from a working lads yeah. sort of thing, you know. In do you some th- ways. Do you think that's do you think that's can we talk about um sort of this year these there's, there's loads of like newer drivers coming to the sport and it seems to be it seems to be quite healthy. Mm. But do you think it is a bit too expensive or do you, do you think it's you know what what can they do I guess to to make it a bit more affordable for some? Our tires is the biggest thing probably. Yeah. Yeah. But it's such a, such a big issue. Yeah. You know, I, I've I, I've steered well clear of the politics of the sport <laughs> really because I, I for one thing I haven't time, you know. Yeah. I admire the lads who do find time to do it and they've you know, they come to meetings and then they're involved at the meetings as well. I don't know how they do it really. No. I, I couldn't do that. No. No. No tyres. Mm. Sophie's listening. She's like, oh, okay, I'm making out. John Lund says tyres. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my last question. Um, so 2021, um, you, you raced predominantly. Yeah, you, you did one, one um, out in the Skegness for the, for the semi-final meeting yeah. in the Twitch Yale car. Um, a, did you enjoy it, being back on tarmac? And is it, actually, I wouldn't mind giving it another go, maybe, possibly? No, well, I do. En- yeah. I still enjoy racing on tarmac, but it's just a time thing. Yeah. Getting your car set up, I mean... That was racing my shell car. It wasn't really suited to the track, and yeah. I built this this car, which was stood next to. Um, we started with it when um, Coventry was still running, right, okay. and I was sort of building the car more with shell in mind and Coventry in mind, really. And then Coventry, and that's how long I've been on with it, really. <laughs> so f- for Skegness, it. It didn't really suit that yeah. tarmac surface. It's too heavy at the back, and but it did all right, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I, d- I wasn't at the meeting, but you know, reading stuff about it, and, and people were saying you were getting like better and better and better oh, as, the, yeah. as the as the meeting went on. I think it was perhaps driver as well, a bit rusty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it was really. again by the end. It was quite good, but it was hard on the tyres because it was right. heavy at the back. Yeah. And, mm. Okay. So there's there's quite a difference, I think, between the. So tarmac maybe, cars yeah. and the shell cars nowadays. Yeah. Mm. So maybe it is like sticking to shell for the foreseeable. Well, I keep looking at that tarmac car. I think, oh, I probably should have another deal with it. But <laughs> <laughs> whether we will. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, this is my project, maybe, for well, the rest of this winter, but we'll have to be quick now. I just tarmac car, but it's. Um, a bit of a shelf at the moment. We've got fresh bus seats for the bus. We'll need to get them in as well. But uh, we might get it going again. <laughs> so we're at Steve Harrison's workshop. Steve, we've come to see you because, yeah. we've, as you know, we've been and spent uh, a lot of time with John Lunds, yeah. and you've done some, something very, very important. <laughs> you've like refreshed his, or refurbished his uh, favourite car. He told us, you know, we said, what's your, what's your favourite car, John? And he went, the gold car. The so, gold car. so let's talk about that. So what's yeah. the story? Well, the story is, back in 2003, I bought the car off uh, a guy called uh, Simon Gill, yep. 290, didn't really know what I was buying at the time, knew it was a John Lund car, didn't know it was the gold car, time ticked on and we, we saw John at, um, at Sheffield, yep. uh, he said it was the best car I'd ever had, it was the gold car, I thought right, uh, anyway I had a lot of fun with it and then I decided to sort of pack up racing, the way things were going, I was getting a bit older, you know how it is. So I'm not old, so I don't know. No, no, I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't saying that. <laughs> but uh, decided to take it back to what John used to, what it used to be, you know. Okay. Uh, everybody remembers the gold car. So um, back in, I don't know, December, maybe January, um, we decided to take it back to, to of, what of it was. 2021, was it, would that be? Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, January this year, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, set about it and it all sort of come together really good you know it was a pleasure doing so how long did the project take from sort of beginning to end well really from from january until maybe two weeks before the world final before we showed it at the world world final like you know yeah realistically um but such a brilliant car there wasn't a vast amount to do to it yeah um some you know like the bonnet the the aerofoil some of the bits and bobs, and obviously get the colours right. So how did you how did you do it? Obviously, there's pictures, and was it just from pictures, or did John kind just, of get involved? Just and... from pictures. 
we were sort of in contact with John. We were trying to keep it undercover yeah. because we didn't want everybody knowing what we were doing, like, yeah. you know, a bit of a surprise. So, sort of, John was sort of pointing us in the right direction a little bit, but not a, not a great deal, you know. A lot of it was off photos and videos and whatever we could get hold yeah. of, you know. Um, which is pretty hard work, really, because you don't get dimensions off photos, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I think we pulled it off, yeah, yeah we, we got it together, yeah. When we were talking about the gold car, you were saying that gold is a really difficult colour to get right, was that... Oh, yeah. <laughs> We, we probably did, I don't know, five or six or seven little samples, you know, mixing our own gold up, yeah. you know, from the base gold, making it darker, lighter, whatever we've got to do. We finally picked one that we think looked the right one, you know, and I took it down and got it colour matched. And hey, presto, yeah. it's what you see. Absolutely. You know, well, we think it's about right, it's hard to say, very hard to say. Well, the thing was, what did John say? Do you know what I mean? Did he say it was about right? John said it was about right. <laughs> he said it sounded right as well you know which it does do because it's got the original engine in it yeah. apart from the block the block had to be changed because there was some cracks of developing we didn't like it yeah. so shame to waste all of it like you know what i mean so you're saying we obviously we're talking to, to you was there not just you that did that no happen? not just me there's myself there's jason uh marcus mark another mate of mine alan uh craig there's quite a few of us you know we're we, we all said no photos, we don't want no photos going out of the workshop, period, like, you know, and, and they stuck to it, yeah. Did they sign an NDA? That's what no. I signed my work all the time, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> so no. I guess the biggest thing, though, and then the biggest credit to yourselves was, was the world final itself. So yeah. how did that come about? Right, we sort of approached Steve Rees yeah. to see if we, you know, we sort of told him what we were doing, we were hoping to do. Anyway, it, it went on and... John hadn't qualified for the world final, which was, we thought, well, cracker, what are we going to do? Oh, you know, is it still going to happen? And then obviously at Sheffield he did. I yeah. thought, right, it's got to be on now. And again, we asked Sophie if yeah. it would be possible. She did a lot of running around and planning and stuff like that. And um, yeah, we managed to get it up to the world final in Mark Woodall's coach, so nobody could see it. Uh, I took his car up and um, scurried it down near the track so nobody could see it like and push sheet over it and nobody was none the wiser no. nobody knew no. couple, couple of drivers knew there's one guy trying to take photos and yeah we told him you know don't go putting this on the internet yeah. like that because it's a surprise like you know but it was a huge secret because like i mean you know i talked to safe quite a bit and safe was like we've got this surprise with john london at the world final and i was like what is it she's like i can't tell you do you know what i mean it was like, like oh you like, didn't yeah, even know right, right. right. You know, yeah you know, i'm not yeah. privileged at all you know what i mean but it was like it was yeah it was huge but the thing is you must I mean, you were there obviously on world final night oh, it yeah. must have been such oh. for you to see to take this. john around yeah. that track uh, obviously i believe it was the the last car that ever won a final at Bradford yeah, when it shut yeah. before it shut and obviously he's had great success I think those two worlds won there I don't know anyway it, oh brilliant yeah. the fan, it was, I'll never forget it yeah. fantastic everybody was on on the feet yeah. clapping cheering it was spectacular yeah. brilliant and I think John loved it as yes. well he was lapping it up yeah yeah, yeah I mean, when we spoke to him I mean, it feels like a long time ago it was this morning um, yeah. but certainly it was, it was very emotive when he was yeah. talking about the yeah. car and I guess what you guys had done and yeah. you know what it meant to him to be able to go around on that parade lap and well, have that reception yeah we wanted it to be like that you know what I mean yeah. we he's such an iconic driver isn't he you know he's the I, I consider him the best yeah. he's the one that really got me into racing in the first place yeah and Frank as well, like, and a few others, but it had to be done. Yeah, yeah it, it, you know, just to show appreciation yeah. to the man. Fantastic. No, all credit to you and the guys that did yeah. it. So what's the plan for the car now? Because obviously it, it looks right. immaculate, you know, it's, it's brilliant. So what, It what does gonna, look good, doesn't it? Yeah, so what are you going to do? I'd like to do some heritage with it and yeah. just take it around the country, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mostly the north, and just show it off and do a few laps in it, enjoy it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Without getting knocked out, etc. Yeah. And that's the plan for this year. Um, I, I'm sort of involved with the Heritage boys, if you like, and yeah, there's quite a few meetings this yeah, year. Hopefully, good. he's going to. Good, mm. Steve. I think, uh, thank you for letting us come to your workshop. It's a hey, brilliant workshop. I like welcome. your animals as yeah. much as I like the car, <laughs> but it looks fantastic. And, and thank you for, for letting us come. Hey, you're more than welcome. More than right. welcome. Thank, thank you very much. much. Cheers.